Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm James Ward, and I'm head of school for Cambridge School of Creative Industries. Um, before I introduce this evening proper, I'll just go through some basic housekeeping, which we've been a physical room would have been all the fire exit, but now it is actually to go through the recording. So please note that this session today we recorded. Be rest assured that if your cameras are switched off, you will not feature the recording this session. Um, if you have any questions, we are welcome to do so. They will appear in the recording. So with that in mind, if you have any questions during the talk, please just drop them in the chat function or at the end, we'll be able to um, have a Q&A generally where if you switch your camera on, obviously you'll be recording in with that. So welcome to um, the HSS Present Series. This is the first one of the new academic year and the first one um, actually for October, which is Black History Month. So it's great to have um, the title tonight of Justice, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion and why it pays to be inclusive. I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Emmanuel Osigwe to you later on in a bit. Um, I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of Emmanuel and his amazing history of his career to date and show you a short film, and then we'll be handing over to Emmanuel. So Emmanuel is the founder and chairman of the British Urban Film Festival and was invited to become a BAFTA voting member in December, 2020. In December, 2019, it was announced in the 2020 New Year's Honours list that Emmanuel was to be awarded an MBE for services to black and minority ethnic film industry. He went on to receive his medal from His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales at Buckingham Palace in March 2020. In a career that spanned 19 years to date, Emmanuel has worked with Channel Television News in London, Black Filmmaker Magazine, the Screen Nation Awards, and has written for both the Voice newspaper and the TV Collective. He's also produced and presented film programmes on colourful radio and was previously headhunted to the post of Head of Cinema at the Barbican. Emmanuel is the British Urban Film Festival in 2005. This urban showcase is an independent cinema in the absence of such state-sponsored activity in the UK at the time. To date, the fest was screened over 500 films facilitating broadcast platforms, majority of black and urban independent writers actors, actresses, producers, and directors on Apple TV, Netflix, Amazon, Prime Video, BBC iPlayer, Channel 4, Community Channel, Now Together, Showcase TV, and London Live. Bit of a mouthful, getting there. So um, in October 2020, the festival was granted with BAFTA qualifying status for British short films. In February 2018, the co-founder of Buff Originals was launched to act as production and distribution arm of British Urban Film Festival. Emmanuel's debut feature, No Shade, was released in UK cinemas in 2018, making director Claire Anyam Oziwe the sixth black female British director to date to secure theatrical distribution in over 120 years. In December 2020, Claire, Emmanuel's wife, an American Movie Academy Award for No Shade. And now I'm just gonna, hopefully if it works, share my screen to show a, a short film for you now. The film Festival for Diversity in the World. This is Bath. Right, um, we finally got to see the buff teaser. Thanks very much, James. Thanks very much for that introduction. Uh, a couple of corrections, although uh, if Claire, you're watching, James did say that you won an American 
Movie Academy Award, which I hope you do in the not too distant future, because that's the Oscars. But in fact, what Claire did win was the African Movie Academy Award, which is otherwise known as the AMRA Award, which she won um, last year. So um, yeah, I just thought I'd correct that, but hopefully in the future, you won't have to correct Claire as an American Movie Academy winning director. Just to put that out there. Um, but good evening, everyone. And you're very welcome to today's presentation, which is titled Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Why it pays to be an inclusive organization. Now, the one thing that I can guarantee from today's session is that you will never get the 60 minutes back. So I very much hope that you get as much out of it as I will in bringing it to you. So apart from that, why should you care? Well, you should care because achieving justice, equity, diversity and inclusion in any organization is a journey, not a destination. And as the environment evolves, so does the approach. Today's talk is rooted in facts, theory and lived experiences. I hope that by being here, that it encourages reflection and action. So with that in mind, let me take you back in time to the Sky News Studios, in fact, in central London, July 2020. In this clip, which you're about to see, I was interviewed about the launch of the government's coronavirus insurance scheme, which has recently been extended, by the way, for film and TV producers and production companies. So that here was we announced go. a new £500 million scheme to kickstart film and TV production, struggling to secure insurance for COVID related costs. Uh, let's discuss this with the founder of the British Urban Film Festival, Emmanuel Anyam Osigwe. Emmanuel, really nice to see you this morning. Um, £500 million pounds sounds like a chunk of change. Is it enough? Um, well, firstly, as a taxpayer, it's good to see that the public's finances have been put to good use and it's been given to people who really need it. Um, obviously, since the pandemic broke, in March, a lot of productions have had to close down, a lot of contracts have had to be cancelled, and by that I mean the majority of people in our industries who are freelancers. So this is a shot in the arm for those people and also for those productions who are now able to safely resume production to help uh, kickstart the economy. But in answer to your original question, um, half a billion pounds is clearly not enough, um, and there are other priorities within the film and TV industries that need to be addressed. I mean, uh, as you mentioned, Emmanuel, I mean, there, well, there are 180,000 jobs in the, the film and TV industries in this country. A large percentage of them will be those tax-paying freelancers that, that, that fell through the, the furlough net. I mean, how many of them might not be returning to the industry after all this is over? Yes, that's, that's a very important point that you've made there, Neil, because um, my understanding is that uh, there were over 3 million people that weren't able to qualify for the furlough scheme, neither were they eligible for the self-employed income support scheme. So at most, there's 3 million that we're going to lose in the industry and probably a whole lot more. Obviously, the furlough is due to end, the furlough scheme, should I say, is due to end in October. So we've not really seen uh, the effects, the long-lasting effects um, that this pandemic is going to cause within the industry. Um, but like I said, this is an insurance scheme. So this is in the event of future productions being lost as a result of a potential second wave. So it obviously, the, 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 um, it's all about the detail in terms of how much of that money is going to be made available to these productions. But I stress again, there are other priorities in the industry that need to be addressed. And speaking as um, a black owner of a film business, um, that is especially pertinent in the, in the wake of Black Lives Matter. Uh, on a related point then, uh, Emmanuel, in terms of those producers, the production companies, be they film or television, wanting to get back in, you know, we'll know many of the bigger names, but the smaller, more independent Bijou um, producers, uh, it, it strikes me that they may very well have been so hard hit that there might not be the opportunity for them to get back up and running, uh, even if we avoid that second wave? 
Absolutely. And this is where I kind of call on the government to kind of do more to start this conversation with these companies, um, especially black and minority ethnic uh, companies, um, to see where the financial holes can be plugged. And also there are other issues such as how this money is being made available, who's making these decisions, why these decisions are being made, and um, what is being done to empower freelancers, self-employed, working class individuals, black and minority ethnic individuals, what is being done in the communications to ensure that everyone um, is protected um, by the effects of this pandemic. And Emmanuel, we're running out of time, so briefly, if you can, but, but you've been doing your bit yourself, haven't you? A finance scheme uh, to try and assist young, uh, well, to try and assist black uh, film, filmmakers. Here, tell us just a little bit about that. Yes, so literally, um, it was on the 1st of July, so four weeks today, that I just woke up one morning and decided with what I've done in the industry for over 20 years, getting an MBE in the process for my services to black film, what could I do in terms of the conversation? And for me, it was more than a conversation. So I put money from my own pocket, so it's not from any companies, not working with anyone in particular, and I put myself out there and said, Black filmmakers, wherever you are, I'm here to support you. And that scheme is still continuing now. My inbox is being inundated with people from across the sector um, wanting to access this finance. And consequently, I'm now in conversations with film finances to see how much more can be done. But this is just the beginning. Uh, well, well done, you. Uh, Emmanuel, uh, Anyam Osegwe, thank you so much for joining us on the programme this morning. Pleasure, Neil. Thanks. So that was me over 18 months ago, um, talking about the pandemic and the insurance scheme and kind of the role that I played uh, in my own very small way in terms of giving back. By all accounts, the interview was well received on social media, so much so that an hour after it was first broadcast, I received a direct message on LinkedIn from a certain Dr. William Campbell from Anglia Ruskin University who subsequently then invited me to speak on black and minority ethnic issues in film and television. That was 15 months ago. And after several more lockdowns and email exchanges, here I am giving this talk. And so for that, I thank William for making it all possible. So for the last 20 years, I've dedicated my life towards embracing difference and using this to my personal and professional advantage. Last year, as James said at the start, I was invited by Her Majesty the Queen to accept a medal for services to the black and minority ethnic film industry. The only person in UK history to receive this honor. A large part of this recognition can be attributed to the track record and reputation of the organization that I founded in the summer of 2005. Thank you, Kira. So this is the Buff Board, aka the British Urban Film Festival, which I created in the absence of film provision that sufficiently catered for black audiences. Having worked at black led film organizations for three years prior to Buff, I was already exposed to these audiences through the work I was carrying out as a film programmer and exhibitor. It also helped that I was working with people who have a track record and reputation in black British film. Next slide, please. The first person who hired me was this man, Menelik Shabazz, a black British filmmaker of considerable repute, having been only the second black British director to release a feature film in the UK, that film being Burning an Illusion in 1981. He founded Black Filmmaker magazine in 1997 when he returned from the Cannes Film Festival in France and realized that there was no publication in the UK which regularly reported on black film. I was only aware of the magazine when I happened to discover it in the British Film Institute myself. I was a student member at the time and was emboldened by this discovery, which led me to attend the BFM annual film festivals. In 2002, after completing my university degree in media arts with video production, I offered my services to work at Black Filmmaker Magazine, such as my idolization of the magazine and the film festival. There was no vacancy from what I remember, and looking back, all I had to bring to the job was my attitude. That attitude has stayed with me ever since. 
I have a lot to thank Menelik for. Fortunately, I was able to do that three years ago in person at the screening of his film, Looking for Love. Menelik passed away earlier this summer at the age of 67 while shooting his latest film in Zimbabwe. His death continues to leave a hole in my life. I worked with BFM for two years and then spent a year with the Screen Nation Black Film and TV Awards founded by film producer Charles Thompson. Thank you, Kira. Charles went on to receive an MBE for services to Black World Cinema in 2011. Charles was also at BFM when I started working there. And so over those three years, in terms of the experience gained and the skill sets acquired, I couldn't have asked for a better start into the film business and the business of film. At the start of 2005, when I was no longer working at Black-led film organisations, it became apparent that there was no intent, no appetite, no will to cater for Black audiences on a credible or consistent basis, certainly not by the state. Not only was I self-aware that Black audiences were being underserved, there were also other groups of people, working class, disabled, travellers, to name but three, whose presence in film, whether on screen or off screen, was being chronically underserved and marginalised. Thanks, Kira. I couldn't see who would provide a satisfactory solution to the problem. And I soon applied to non-Black-led organisations like the BBC and ITV, especially in the regions. The results, thinking that I could affect change as the result of my honours degree and my unique experience working for Black film organisations. Next slide. The penny finally dropped when I attended an urban music concert later that year, 2005, by the way, organised by the Prince's Trust a charity founded by Prince Charles to assist 11 to 30 year olds in moving them into work, education or training. The concert was attended by over 15,000 young people, mainly black, and it occurred to me at the time that if a white man as powerful as Prince Charles could mobilize thousands of young black people in such a positive way, why couldn't I, as a young black British man, do the same? There was only one way to find out. Play the clip. Right, so tell us more about Buff, the British Urban Film Festival. How and why did it begin? So it all started in West London, funnily enough, back in 2005. Uh, when I was heading up the African Caribbean Society at my uni, which is at Thames Valley University, <laughs> which is now University of West London. And we went to the Prince's Trust Urban Music Festival, as it was back in 05, and Will Smith and A. Conrad. Gosh, I'd forgotten about guests. that. Yes. Yeah. You were probably there. Uh, okay. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, brands, they come and they go. That's they why do. the brands that last forever, you've got to respect them. Indeed, indeed. So it's at that event that I said to my friend who was with me at the time, um, you've got all these people in one room organised by Prince Charles, and why aren't we as black people doing something similar? So an urban music festival concept then became an urban film festival concept. Then we just put a B at the end and it became buff. And of course, buff is cute because buff in slanguage means... Well, where do you <laughs> want to start with buff? So Give us the clean version. The buff. clean version. <laughs> Polished. Yeah. In slanguage, in, in street slanguage, buff yeah. means... Nang, peng, <laughs> beautiful. So for anyone driving around going, I have no idea what you're talking about, could you define that in an Oxford English dictionary manner? So buff is a euphemism for something that is beautiful or attractive. So if someone walks past you and goes, she's buff, I can take that as a compliment. Yes. Right. They, they usually put well buff. Well buff. She's end. well buff. Yes. <laughs> okay. But do you think that we are now in a period of more than self-reflection, that uh, the whole industry realises it, it has to change? Oh, very much so. I mean, it's, it's definitely about more action and less talk. I mean... Um, whilst the speech is to be congratulated, um, there's work that needs to be done. Um, I mean, like you said, I 
founded the British Urban Film Festival 13 years ago because I care about how I'm represented, uh, not just on screen, but off screen as well. So when I didn't see um, myself um, through an organization, um, I set up one by myself. And like I said, 13 years later, um, we are creating our own systems to look after the best creative talent that there is in the UK. So it's not about waiting, it's actually about doing. For nearly two decades, Emmanuel Anyamosigwe's obsession with diversity has won the hearts and minds of filmmakers and audiences alike. His blueprint for how minorities should be represented has stood the test of time, long before the penny dropped for other institutions far and wide that diversity truly matters. This year, as BUFF marks its 15th anniversary, the more things change, the more things stay the same. Never has diversity been more relevant than in 2020. And as long as the issue remains in the public eye, Emmanuel has ensured that for creatives everywhere, the British Urban Film Festival is a broad church that welcomes all creeds and all colors, comfortable in its own skin and bold in its approach to storytelling and showcasing film as seen through the social and cultural lens. From BFM to Buckingham Palace, it's been quite a journey for the man who literally bet the house on making Buff the success that it is today. Okay. So that was Buff in a nutshell. Um, and as it said in the VT, I literally bet the house on funding the film festival. But that's a story for another time where I literally mortgaged the family home to set up the film festival. But like I said, that's another story for another time. So for now, let's get into this theory about what it means to be an inclusive organization. One of the most important issues that companies will have to tackle in the coming decade. So here is my belief about inclusion in the workplace and you can see it on the screen. People need the ability to work with the dignity of having their histories acknowledged and their life experience valued. Only then will companies be able to recruit and retain the thriving diverse workforce that leaders and customers want and need in the next decade and beyond. Once we can achieve this, we must continue to build and maintain this culture of prioritizing humanity on a daily basis. If it was that easy, everyone would be doing it. The reason that it's hard is because there's no consistent consensus as to whether there's a problem in the first place. In the case of racism, in order to address it, one must then ask what is the problem and where does the problem come from? Once people are aware of the problem and its underlying causes, the next question is whether they care enough to do something about it. There is a difference between sympathy and empathy. Many white people experience sympathy or pity when they witness racism. But what's more likely to lead to action in confronting the problem is empathy, experiencing the same hurt and anger that people of color are feeling. People of color want solidarity and social justice, not sympathy which simply quiets the symptoms while perpetuating the disease. When it comes to biased behavior, your intentions don't matter. The only thing that matters are the outcomes that your behavior creates. When people say, I don't see color, this is clearly not true. When we claim not to see color, we're denying the lived experiences of black people and other people of color. We have to see color in order to embrace the beauty of diversity and do the work to ensure equality. Meet my wife, Claire Anyam Osigwe, a woman of many talents. Now an award-winning filmmaker, she herself was honored by Her Majesty for services to dermatology back in 2017. When setting up her skincare business in 2011, 
She used the alias Nina Fredericks to get people to engage with her on LinkedIn. She recalls her own whitening story in the book Slaying Your Lane, where pretending that Fredericks worked for her, my wife would post a picture of a blonde haired, blue eyed woman found on Google. She soon discovered that people were much more likely to respond to her fictitious and much less well qualified employee than they were when she reached out personally. Once she set up a meeting using her fake name, she explained that Fredericks couldn't make it and to her client's initial consternation turned up herself. A good example of the difficulties black women face even after they've managed to land a job or start their own businesses. Add the fact that they're routinely paid less than their colleagues despite having the same qualifications and you can see how hard life can be when you face constant discrimination. Now, when people say you can be black, white or purple, it's all the same to me as long as you've got the money, this is not true either. Say that to the black family I know of who wanted to buy a one million pound house in an upmarket neighborhood and upon arriving at the house for a tour with the estate agent, the police are called. Another phrase, I just want the best person for the job. Another line, how is this biased? How is this problematic? There is no deciding who is the best person for a job without the beliefs of the decider coming into play. All kinds of unexamined, unintentional, implicit bias shows up in those measurements. It is exhausting to prove your intelligence, to prove your competence and prove your worth especially when others around you don't have to. And that level of exhaustion is simply unsustainable. So you will lose the people who have to put up with it. We all have a need and an obligation to look at these issues and examine the part we all play in them, regardless of our own backgrounds. Now, if you have a human brain, which I assume everyone does, then you naturally have bias. You can actually write that down right now. I have a human brain, therefore I have bias. Now, if you're feeling judged at this point, it's tough. We have to be humble and own up to this fact of life. We move forward a lot faster if we stop protecting ourselves and our positions. Drop your defenses. Now, biologically, as you can see in the picture, your brain automatically releases cortisol, which is a stress hormone when you encounter anything or anyone you're not expecting. One way you can dissipate cortisol is by taking a deep breath. So by taking deep breaths, both literally and metaphorically, you allow yourself to be open to hearing things about your brain, your company, your community, that have room for improvement. The biggest room in any house or any company is the room for improvement. The tragedies and protests we all witnessed last year across the United States have increased public awareness and concern about racism as a persistent problem in our society. The question we now must confront is whether as a society, we are willing to do the hard work necessary to change widespread attitudes, assumptions, policies, and practices. Now, unlike society at large, the workplace very often requires contact and cooperation among people from different racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds. Therefore, leaders should host open and candid conversations about how organizations are using their power to press for profound and perennial progress. One way to increase empathy is through exposure and education. The video of George Floyd's murder exposed people to the ugly reality of racism in a visceral, protracted and undeniable way. Similarly, in the 1960s, Northern whites, northern white people, witnessed innocent black protesters being beaten with batons 
and blasted with fire hoses on national television. What best prompts people in an organization to register concern about racism in their midst? Speaking from experience are the moments when their non-white co-workers share vivid detailed accounts of the negative impact that racism has on their lives. Managers can raise awareness and empathy through psychologically safe listening sessions for employees who want to share their experiences without feeling obligated to do so. Supplemented by education and experiences that provide historical and scientific evidence of the persistence of racism. Empathy is critical for making progress toward racial equity because it affects whether individuals or organizations take any action, and if so, what kind of action they take. There are at least four ways to respond to racism. One, join in and add to the injury. Two, ignore it and mind your own business. Three, experience sympathy and bake cakes for the victim. Or four, experience empathic outrage and take measures to promote equal justice. The personal values of individual employees and the core values of the organization are two factors that affect which actions are undertaken. Now I want you to take a look at this. This is data compiled last year by the American Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, a federal agency that, would that was established via the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to administer and enforce civil rights laws against workplace discrimination. Now it found that the commission accepted 67,448 charges of discrimination in 2020. Now bear in mind that there are probably 10 times as more charges that weren't filed due to intimidation, ignorance or other factors. Now of those 67,000 448 charges of discrimination, the Commission secured $439.2 million for victims of discrimination. On average, each employee lawsuit cost companies a quarter of a million dollars. That's half a billion dollars paid out because companies didn't show empathy towards their staff. Now, what this slide also shows is that most victims of discrimination are likely to win their lawsuit based on what's known as retaliation discrimination. Now, there was a time when most lawsuits were won on the grounds of racial discrimination. What this slide shows is that most lawsuits last year in the States were won on the grounds of retaliation than on the grounds of disability discrimination than on the grounds of racial discrimination. Simply put, retaliation is always a potential cause of action if someone has complained about discrimination in the workplace. Now, once an employee has complained about discrimination, you've engaged in what is referred to as protected activity. Any adverse action that an employer takes against that employee after this point could be used to demonstrate that it was taken in retaliation for the employee engaging in protected activity. So for example, if you file a complaint with the EEOC or the UK equivalent claiming you were discriminated against and one week later you were terminated, you could file a separate claim alleging that your discharge was in retaliation for having filed a complaint. At that point, employers are not allowed to retaliate against employees for engaging in protected activity. Consequently, employers are left to count the cost of their actions. Now, it goes without saying that there is so much more to be said about justice, equity, diversity and inclusion, which is Jedi for short, by the way, hence the picture, in the workplace and why it pays to be an inclusive organization. 
a Jedi, just like in the Star Wars movies. Those of you that are Star Wars fans will know all about how the Jedis move and operate. So there are similarities in many ways in relation to this topic. But that's another story for another time, just like so many other stories that I have. But as James said to me in the rehearsals yesterday, I only have one hour. So I'll move on. Um, the work of building and maintaining an inclusive, racially equitable culture is never done. The personal work alone to challenge our own individual and professional socialization is like peeling a never ending onion. Like this one. Now, organizations must commit to sustained steps over time to demonstrate that they are making a multifaceted and long term investment in the culture. If for no other reason than to honor the vulnerability that staff members bring to the process. This work is hard and takes a deeply personal toll. The process is only as good as the commitment, trust and goodwill from the staff who engage in it whether that's confronting one's own white fragility or sharing the harms that one has experienced in the office as a person of color over the years. Organizations cannot afford not to do this work, but they also can't enter into it lightly under the misconception that diversity training or a webinar checks the box. True racial equity and inclusion work in the workplace must look unlike anything we've done in past decades because, we're because we've consistently failed, excuse me, to tackle racial inequity at its deepest roots. Today is a new day. It's time to stop looking for easy answers. It's time to hear and amplify those voices that have been silenced for too long. It's time to stop looking for people in our workplaces to be a culture fit and seek out, celebrate and sponsor those who are a culture ad. It's time to hold ourselves accountable for the inadvertent racist, sexist and prejudiced outcomes our behavior creates and our society creates and our history creates. To move forward, we must focus on the outcomes, not the intentions or the guilt or the moral judgments, but to look at the landscape of what is and ask, how do we get to where we want to be and then take the difficult, strenuous and treacherous journey of self-examination it takes to get there. Policy decisions can't be made and relationships shouldn't be formed in spaces where anyone is not made welcome. The same applies even if made to feel unwelcome. Access to leadership has to be equally available to all. We're told almost on a daily basis that diversity is an important issue. And today I'm here to tell you that it's not a complicated issue to solve. Just act on it, just do it. To do the right thing, is to recognize that people are given gifts and talents wrapped in a wide array of packaging, light colored and dark colored, male and female, everyone. If that truth is embraced and acted upon, then fairness, justice and equality of opportunity will be the byproducts. And most of all, divisiveness does not have to continue if we choose unconditional love for people, because love never fails. We end today's presentation with another short film. Now this film tells the story about how the world's richest sports league, the NFL, National Football League in America, how it's grappled with the issue of diversity, equity and inclusion for over a century. Play the tape. April 15th, 1947. It was like the spirits of the Negro Leagues carried number 42 onto that diamond. Through the hate, the bigotry, the pain, 
The barrier keeping black players out of the major leagues was now forever broken. And the legend of Jackie Robinson was born. I mean, nobody in baseball will ever wear number 42 again because of that man and that moment. But I bet you already knew that story. Maybe you've seen the movies, read the books. So let me tell you a different story. One that's been overshadowed for far too long. Just imagine you're invisible. No one hears you. No one sees you. So no one remembers you. You're the best at what you do, but you don't get an audience and nobody's giving you a stage. Think about how utterly helpless that would make you feel. That's what it was like for countless black athletes whose names we'll never know. So what was the NFL's Jackie Robinson moment? How do we get to today, the Super Bowl, the biggest stage in sports? Well, in order for me to give you this complicated tale, I'm gonna have to take you back years. No, decades before Jackie. It's the Roaring Twenties, and on September 26, 1920, the National Football League is born. With over 300 players in leather helmets, the league looked exactly like what you would imagine. But guess what? No color barrier. That's right, from day one, the NFL was integrated, if that's what you want to call it. 14 teams, two black players. One of those men you may have even heard of, Hall of Famer Fritz Pollard. Fritz's athleticism was undeniable on both sides of the ball. He could run like an Olympian, tackle like a wrestler, and in a sport that struggles to this very day to put black head coaches to work, Fritz did that too. But despite his success, progress was slow. There'd only been 13 black players since the league was started and things were about to get worse. In the midst of the Great Depression, league owners met secretly to discuss their growing league and the Negro's place in it. They decided that these colored boys were bad for business. Call it what you want, but this gentleman's agreement made it clear as day, blacks were not allowed to play in their league anymore, period. Just like that, one by one, those men were erased from the rosters taking with them the brief history of the black athlete and the National Football League. Now I bet you're wondering, how in the world do you go from a handful of black players to zero to the NFL we see today? Well, this part of the story takes us to Cleveland, Ohio. It's 1945 and the Cleveland Rams are champions of the NFL. Even though it was called the National Football League, it was more regional than national. You see, because all 10 teams played in the north and mostly eastern part of the country. So the new champs saw an opportunity to do something bold. They left Cleveland, taking their talents where no other team had gone before, west. The Rams planned to display their football prowess on Tinseltown's grandest stage, the L.A. Memorial Coliseum. But this iconic stadium was located right in the middle of one of L.A.'s proudest black communities, which meant it was funded by black tax dollars. A fact that didn't go unnoticed by a group of prominent black journalists, led by Haley Harding, who pushed back. Why should this all-white team from this all-white league get to play their games in our stadium? And you know what? The entire community agreed. In a meeting with the Rams, Haley Harding gave them the answer. Kenny Washington. Now, Kenny Kingfish Washington was the man in Southern California. No stranger to the lights, the cameras, and the action. Like any true L.A. kid, he knew his way around a film set as an actor. But the silver screen never captured his heart. Football did. As a homegrown product of UCLA, Kenny broke all kinds of records, even led the nation in scoring. So, of course, his next step was the NFL, right? Wrong. 
Remember, it's 1945. Black players did not play in the National Football League. So, here we are yet again, faced with that same question. What is the NFL's Jackie Robinson moment? It's this moment, right here. March 21st, 1946. Kenny Washington signs with the Los Angeles Rams, breaking that 13-year unofficial color barrier in the NFL. This is what led us to Doug Williams. This is what got us to Tony Dungy and Ozzie Newsom. This is what gave us Marlon Briscoe, Jim Brown, Walter Payton, and all the black players who defied the odds, inspiring those who make the National Football League look like the nation that it represents today. Long after that day in 1946, Kenny Washington remains in the shadows, not in the Hall of Fame, like his friend and college teammate, Jackie Robinson. But remember this, it was 198 days before Jackie that Kenny Washington stepped out of that tunnel, blazing the trail for a new era on the gridiron. And that was the moment the black football player was invisible no more. And that's the end, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your time. Um, all feedback is welcome at this point because feedback is the gift that keeps on giving. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Manuel. That's very interesting and thanks a lot. Have we got any questions anyone would like to put in either to the chat or put out um, to Manuel by switching your camera on and just letting yourself be known to us? Nothing else yet. I guess I'll ask a couple then whilst we're waiting. Um, but I think to, looking back and obviously you've gone through your career for the last 20 years and have been very successful in doing that in what has been industry, which is, as you've demonstrated, quite racist and what that's in the sense of what talent could come through from different areas. I was going to say, but what was the, sort of the resilience which you built up and what did, would you take from that, which might support our students from black or minority ethnic groups in moving forward in the future once they've graduated? That's, that's a good question, James, in terms of resilience, because you certainly need a lot of resilience to kind of kind of long it out in terms of the journey that I've been on. I mean, everyone's got their own kind of journeys. Mine, mine is a very personal one where I had very minimal experiences of racism personally. Um, but there was one notable kind of exception, which was a couple of years ago. Uh, in relation to my dealings with BAFTA, which I won't go into into too much detail, but there were certain things that um, BAFTA did um, where that kind of issue of racism was kind of put in the spotlight. And so I couldn't ignore it, as I was saying in my presentation, that there were things that you can do in that situation. So what I did was to call it out because I just couldn't leave it unchecked because not only did it affect me personally, but professionally it affected me and it also had a potential knock-on effect for other people, uh, principally my peers, people that have gone before me and people coming up, such as graduates. So it was very important for me to kind of take a stand um, whilst also being the solution through the festival, because I'm very much a solutions person. Obviously there's a lot of issues that we all have gripes about um, and there's not many solutions that are kind of kicking up kicking around so obviously with buff that that still remains a solution for writers and filmmakers to kind of access through our submissions process um, and we have quite a pipeline of talent um, that we're very proud to showcase this year as well as in previous years we have loads of great people doing great things across the industry so it, it's very much a case of when that moment comes when you're under attack that you kind of find it within yourself to either call it out and take it straight on and just not think about the consequences. Just know that the justice has to be served and the injustice has to be identified. Uh, it's not 
the same for everyone. It's not an easy thing to do, but as I said in the presentation, none of what we're talking about here today is an easy thing to do, but um, the benefits going forward are immeasurable. Great, thanks. And then one of your slides, I was to that flashback to my child at the Banglia TV, and it, it got me thinking, you know, in sense of the, um, in sense of, you know, the, the local talent which we've got in, in Cambridge, obviously where we're based, at, in, in, in particular my school, the Coach Vinters School, and historically, I know most of the students, particularly from a black minority ethnic group or uh, other different groups, have tended to head to London to, to, to make that creative career. And I, I just wondered if that's still the case or if you'll find that some of the, the sort of films and things you're being submitted to you and, and to the festivals actually can be much more regionally across the country or has it still got that sort of London sort of bias to it? Um, again, that's, an, that's a great question, James, because it speaks to my... <clears throat> It speaks to kind of my childhood. So growing up, I was a big fan of regional um, television and ITV was kind of the king of regional television because depending on which part of the country you were in, <clears throat> you had your own kind of ITV. So for people in the east of England, they had Anglia. In London, you actually had two ITV channels. You had Thames, which was Monday to Friday, and then you had London Weekend Television, which was Friday to Sunday. Um, and within that period of the 80s and 90s, is that's kind of what formulated my kind of love for film and television. Um, watching the likes of Tales of the Unexpected, which was produced by Anglia Television. Um, and that was really the, the catalyst for me to kind of get into film and television. Obviously reading Roald Dahl at school and then seeing him in vision, literally sitting on that chair in the fireplace and the title sequence and all the crazy stories that evolved from that series, which thankfully you can still watch on YouTube or on other kind of cable channels, speaks to kind of what you're saying about why for students from across the country, it's very important to understand the heritage of film and TV in this country, because it's a very, very rich heritage. And I encourage uh, students and just people at large to access uh, that resource, um, where, wherever and whenever you can. And as a festival, we, we've been able to attract submissions from across the country. We have a large contingent every year of submissions from the Midlands, which is the second most diverse region in the United Kingdom. So obviously that's not an accident in terms of the submissions that we get from Birmingham and the Midlands. Um, and over the past several years, Buff has been working with the likes of the Aesthetica Short Film Festival up in York in the north. Um, we've had a presence at the Edinburgh Festival in August. And we have great relationships with a lot of kind of other festivals um, kind of within our midst. So festivals like the Bolton Film Festival um, in the Northwest, um, the Iris Prize LGBT Festival in Cardiff, who are one of our qualifying partners. So wherever you look, we kind of have an imprint around the country. And that's something that I think will continue to give the festival life and importance and relevance because um, that's what it says across the top. It's British Urban Film Festival. It's not London centric, which is what a lot of uh, festivals kind of focus on. We're very much all about the regionality and the richness of stories that evolve from those regions. Great, right, thank you. And then um, one final thing, I think because we're almost out of time um, um, and that is, um, I think we discussed yesterday, but I don't, don't think you mentioned it today about your book. So I don't know if you want to do a, a plug for your forthcoming book. And then hopefully, as we said, um, we'll get to have some type of launch event in the near future where, where we might be physically able to perhaps get you to sign a copy. But yeah, if you just give us a brief overview of the books, I think it can get people ready and thinking about when it comes out. Yeah, no, th thanks for the pre plug James. So yeah, I'm, I'm writing a book at the moment which chronicles the history of Black British film um, primarily through the prism of directors who have had theatrical releases over the past 50 years. So I've been writing that book for the last 18 months. Um, I've pretty much spoken to every Black British director that there's been. Uh, there's not been that many, so that kind of makes it easier, but still it's an issue that people are not aware of. And I hope to bring that to the public at some point next year. But it goes without saying that to be able to do that book and to continue doing the film festival as well as all the other projects that I'm doing is now becoming unfeasible. 
And so this year will mark the, a changing of the guard, as it were, at the British Library Film Festival, where I will be succeeded by Justin Chinnery, who will this year become Buff's third festival director in its 16 year history. So um, Justin, if you're watching, um, good luck, because you're gonna need it. Um, but hopefully I've left the festival in a great position for you to kind of take it in your own direction. And, and I'm sure you have uh, the best wishes and will of everyone connected with the festival, whether that's filmmakers, audiences, writers, and all other stakeholders. So um, as I kind of step down from my festival role, um, things like my book will be something that I'll take more prominence in doing, as well as my duties as a film producer um, with regards to the various film and TV projects that I'm working on as we speak, and which you'll be hearing about um, in various places over the next few weeks or months. So there's a lot happening, um, but all exciting as well. Great. Well, thank you. And there will be getting a few copies of that book in the, in the library when it's out. So thank you very much for that. And um, thank you very much again for tonight. It's been really interesting and insightful. I think um, one of the things many of us need to take from a, from a white background, particularly, is that, is that empathy and, and supporting you know, diversity and making sure that, that, that we call it our champion and we give that equal voice to enable that to go forward. So thank you very much. It's been really interesting. And thanks for those who've come. And um, we look forward to hopefully seeing you face to face in, in the near future when, when that book comes out. But thanks all for coming and thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, James. Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks very much.